Avrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you for your Shabbat. We thank you for this time together. Uh, we ask that you move mightily and powerfully in our midst, that you speak into our hearts and our lives today, that as we open up uh, your word today, that you will speak boldly into our hearts and our minds, that you will move mightily in our midst. Lord, I pray that nothing of me will be involved except that which you have ordained specifically for this purpose, and that you will prepare our hearts even now to hear what you have in store for us. B'shem Yeshua Meshachinu. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray, and everyone says, Amen. Amen. All right, so this week we read Parsha Kitetse, which we've talked about a few times now in our Torah service and such, um, and it's Deuteronomy 21, 10 through 25, 19. Kitetse opens and closes with war, right? So for perspective, and we've talked about this a few different times over the course of our journey through uh, Devarim, through Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy doesn't entail much of the journey of Israel in and of itself. It's not relaying to us the history of Israel's experience as they walk through it. That was primarily Numbers, Exodus, and, and a little bit of Leviticus. All right, so about 38 years of Israel's journey, of the 40 years from uh, Egypt to the Promised Land, 38 years, give or take, is covered just in the book of Numbers. Right? So most of the actual details of Israel's journey step by step occurs in numbers. Whereas Deuteronomy covers a, uh, a refresher course, if you would, because by the time we get to chapter one of Deuteronomy, all of the first generation has died off. The second generation is getting ready to enter into the promised land. And the, 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 the Lord is using this final sermon from Moses to reiterate to Israel why it is so important for them to walk in his ways, what not to do like their forefathers did, and so on and so forth. So this Parsha opens and closes with war, not that during the events of the telling of Deuteronomy, thank you, that there was war going on, but rather that uh, Moses is reminding them of the battles that they have faced up to that point because they will be facing more battles again going forward into the promised land. But in between these two stark realities of war, we find 74 mitzvot. There's 613 mitzvot or commandments in the Torah. 74 of them are found here in uh, this week's Parsha, Parsha Ki Tetze, addressing a wide array of issues that B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, might face in their walk with the Lord. Now keep in mind, most of what we find in Deuteronomy is a repetition from previous Torah discussions as a refresher before crossing into the Jordan. Uh, and this is the case with a lot of what we find in this week's Parsha, that it's a reminder of things that have already occurred or have already been spoken. As we process through Ki Tetze, we see that the primary focus of this Parsha is actually twofold. One is Vehafta Larecha Kamocha, Leviticus 19.18. We say it in our uh, service every week. We say it in the Vehafta. If you uh, follow traditional prayers on a daily basis, the Shema and Vehafta, uh, Vehafta Larecha Kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, in other words, there's a way that we are to interact with those around us, and this week's Parsha reminds us of that. In fact, most of Leviticus reminds us of that. A significant portion of Exodus and Numbers remind us of that, of how we are to interact with the world around us. And then the second part is that it's a reminder of the righteousness of the camp before a holy God. Now, <laughs> Uh, I, I preached on this almost exclusively a few years ago because it was really funny, and I just like watching people's faces when I say random off-the-cuff things that kind of throw people for a loop. But this week's Parsha actually has a specific passage, uh, 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 two verses in it, in which we're commanded, and it's the only place we find it, in which we're commanded to carry a shovel with us wherever we go so that when you have to... Uh, move your bowels, you can uh, dig a hole, hide it, bury it over. And it specifically says, because your God walks among you, right? And so the gist of that is that God just doesn't want to step on our crap. So should we should probably get our lives straight so that when we're walking with the Lord, it, there you go, you're welcome. That was my gift from, you, from my heart to you today. But it, it, look, I say that facetiously, but that's literally the order of the verses. Carry a shovel to cover your mess because God doesn't want to step in it. He's walking in your midst, which is ultimately the overarching narrative of what God has called Israel out for in the first place, is to experience the power and presence of the living God of all creation walking in our midst. Right? Genesis, uh, John chapter 1 opens with that very concept, right? That, the, the, that Yeshua comes in human form. The presence of God comes and tabernacles or dwells among us. He walks in our midst. 
And as he does, it's important for us to live our lives in a righteous and holy way. That doesn't mean we're going to do it perfectly all the time, but we're to live our lives in a righteous and holy way so that the world, one, sees God in us, and two, that our lives are led by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, are worthy of the presence of God in our midst. Uh, And so it's a really powerful reality out of two simple verses that outside of the reality of God in our midst kind of seems facetious in the text, and especially where it falls in a place at. And pretty much everything found in Parsha Kitetse covers one of the two issues that we just spoke of, uh, both uh, independently and uh, that are independent and yet very much intertwined realities this week's Parsha. Love your neighbor as yourself, and that the presence of God dwells in your midst. This week's Parsha, in connection with the focus on how we live righteous lives by how we interact with and treat others around us, uh, we, we see a reiteration in this week's Parsha uh, from the command that we find in Numbers chapter 15, the word tzitziot, so where the tassels, the fringes on a gar- cornered garment, so that when we look down upon them, we'll remember to keep the commandments. And in particular, it tells us that the tzitziot are to be tied on with the, with the, the blue string, which is a reminder of the priesthood, because it's the, 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 the word techelet, the color blue, which is really more of like almost a purple kind of a color. Uh, that, that color is tied in with the garments that the priesthood would have worn. It's tied into the royal garments that the king of Israel would have worn, which is ultimately prophetically tied into the reality of Yeshua HaMashiach, who is both our uh, high priest in the order of Malchizedek and our, uh, our Melech Mashiach, our King Messiah. And so when we look down at the tzitziot, uh, it's important that they're, when we wear them, that when we see them, it reminds us of the Word of God. We're not just wearing them out of sheer religious practice. We're not just wearing them, or at least we shouldn't be, out of legalism or, or even idolatry of the, the item itself, but rather as a reminder of the Word of God. I, I like to look at it as kind of a checks and balances in our life, right? It's really easy to, to be led astray and to give in a temptation if we don't have something right in front of our eyes that's reminding us of what's happening, right? Uh, and I, my dad and I always jokingly debate back and forth whether or not CTO should be worn out or tucked in. Uh, my dad wears CTO all the time, but he wears them tucked in. I wear them out all the time. If you ever see me, uh, I've always got a Talikatan on. You always see my CTO. Uh, unless I'm on the bike, I usually will tuck them in my pockets so they're not flapping around getting knotted while I'm on the motorcycle. Uh, but nonetheless, they're there to remind us. And so I always joke with my dad. We'll go, you know, kind of banter back and forth on it. I say, look, the reality is, is the only time you can see them is when you're in the bathroom. They're really not doing you a lot of good, right? Um, there's a lot of world that we live in that's not the bathroom, and it's important for us to be able to see them. Uh, I don't really care if you wear them in or out. Uh, and honestly, it's between you and God whether or not you even wear them. That's uh, not something I'm going to dictate to your life. I will say God says it pretty well on his own, but I'm not going to dictate to you what you do, should do or shouldn't do in your life. Uh, I think even more important is that we're in the Word of God, that it's constantly before our eyes. Uh, when we talk about the uh, the Vehafta and the, we wear uh, in Judaism the phylacteries, uh, the, the tefillin, uh, the, the box with the scrolls on your head and on your arm, it's there to remind us of the Vehafta as we're saying our prayers. It reminds us of the Vehafta. But in particular, I think that even more specific, there's a beauty to the interaction with the command and the tefillin. But I think there's an even deeper value of what the actual command is calling us to do, because when it says to have it in between your eyes and have it on your forearm, I don't think it's specifically talking of the traditional way in which we wear the tefillin, although that is a way of interacting with it, and there's a beauty to that tradition. Uh, But I think it's more specifically talking about we should be daily interacting in the Word of God constantly. It should be before our eyes. It should be upon our arms. Uh, I walk around with my phone or my iPad or whatever with, uh, you know, numerous Bible apps. I have almost every translation I could possibly get my hands on at my fingertips. It is constantly in my midst. And if you watch me, I've always got my phone out. Somebody will say, I'll pull up a passage real quick. We'll look through it. We'll dig through it together. Um, But it's important that the Word of God be a primary focus in our walk with Him. And I think that's the beauty of this reiteration of uh, Numbers 15, the command towards CTO that we see here in Deuteronomy 22, verse 12. So I don't know about you guys. Anybody in the room ever had intrusive thoughts? Now, I'm not going to ask you what they were because some may be way darker than mine. Uh, I mean, you just caught some of how dark my brain can go sometimes, uh, but I'm not going to ask yours because maybe yours are a little more dark than mine. But I, I sometimes uh, have a weakness to give in to those, uh, not in like a violent sense because I don't gen- gen- generally have violent intrusive thoughts. I mean, there definitely are times that somebody will cut me off. I'm like, you know what? I could easily wipe this guy out, but I'm not going to do it. 
the thought does enter every once in a while. But there are some that I've had, like when I was younger, I've gotten a lot better about it now because I've realized how bad it sounds. Um, but when I was younger, uh, me and my friends would drive around. And you remember the what would Jesus do, the WWJD bracelets people used to wear all the time? When those were big, and people still do it now, but when those were big, I would drive down the road and you'd see hitchhikers that had signs that said, what would Jesus do? And me and my buddies would drive, <laughs> it's terrible. We would roll up beside him. I'd roll the window down, and with the car stopped, and then thinking we're going to be nice, I'd lean out and go, he'd walk and pull off. Um, uh, you, <laughs> you have the intrusive thought to do something sarcastic. That's not a very good thing. I'm not recommending do it, uh, but I did, and, and I can tell you it does not make people happy. Um, it's also not really a great witness, uh, but the, the reality is, is that that's a, a big thing. Like, you know, drive past people that are hitchhiking and they've got their thumb out and I drive by giving them a thumbs up too. Um, it's not helpful, right? The, the intrusive thought sometimes just kind of leaks its way out in, uh, in, in what I do in life. And, and then I've got to go back and go, oh, that was terrible. Let me go ask God to forgive me because that was a really horrible way to act, right? Um, and, and maybe you've gone through this. Maybe you've experienced some of this before uh, where you have a thought that maybe you don't filter, which is 98% of my thoughts, but maybe you don't filter it and you act on something and somebody's feelings get hurt, their toes get stepped on, uh, maybe you do something or somebody does something to you that you're not really prepared for, maybe you don't follow through on doing something for somebody, like the Lord puts it on your heart to buy diapers for somebody or buy groceries for somebody or help them get a gallon, a tank of gas or whatever, and you go, I don't have time for that, I don't have uh, the money for that, I don't have this for that or that, and we just ignore what God puts on our heart, right? Sometimes we have these moments where we have unique opportunities to be the hands and feet of Messiah. Uh, and I'm not saying be the hands and feet by picking up a hitchhiker either, because that can be a really dumb and dangerous thing to do, especially in today's world. Um, it's not so dangerous and dumb in Israel because everybody in Israel hitchhikes all the time. It's a really weird cultural thing there that every time I see it, I'm like, that doesn't work back home at all. Like, you're likely going to die back home, but here it works. It's okay. That's great. Um, but, uh, and, and so I'm not saying go pick up every hitchhiker you see, but there is a, a, a unique reality for us as followers of Messiah in which we have a biblical ordinance over and over and over again throughout the text, a biblical ordinance to be what I like to call the hands and feet of Messiah, to walk out our lives as the hands and feet of Messiah. And so with that said, as we're looking at this week's Parsha, uh, I, I want us to hold this principle in mind, and, and that is this. We are empowered with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to serve as the hands and feet of Messiah. Again, we are empowered with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to serve as the hands and feet of Messiah. Now, you may be wondering how in the world we got there from all of the relatively senseless and sarcastic stuff I opened up with. But there's a really interesting thing that we see in this week's Parsha. There's a lot of really interesting things, but there's, there's a really interesting thing that we see this week's, in this week's Parsha that stood out to me as I was preparing for the message today. Um, it jumped out, and instantaneously I start to see connections. You know when you go to a conspiracy theorist's house and they've got the, the, the big wall that has all the pictures and articles and all the red strings running? That was my brain this week as I was <laughs> processing through this. Um, but if you have your scriptures, go ahead and open up. And, and if not, it's going to be on the, tech, on the, the, the screens uh, as well. But I want you to open up to Deuteronomy chapter 23, beginning with verse 4. Deuteronomy 23, verse 4. This is a little later in Parsha Kite. Say a little later in our, our Parsha this week. It says, No Ammonite or Moabite is to enter the community of Adonai, even to the tenth generation. None belonging to them is to enter the community of Adonai forever. Because they did not meet you with bread and water on the way when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, uh, son of Beor, from Petor, of Aram Naharaim, to curse you. But Adonai, your God, refused to listen to Balaam. And Adonai, your God, turned the curse into blessing for you because he loves you. You are never to seek their shalom or welfare all your days. You are not to detest the Edomite. For he is your brother. You are not to detest an Egyptian, for you were an outsider in his land. The children born to them, the third and uh, third generation, may enter the community of Adonai. So we're going to pause here for a second. The third generation of the Egyptian and of the Edomite can enter Israel. In other words, be considered part of Israel. The first generation, the first one that says the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is my God. They're the first generation. 
from the second generation of their children, their grandchildren, or the third generation, their grandchildren are now considered blood part of Israel. This is where in traditional Judaism today, if you were to convert to Judaism, you were considered a proselyte or a convert to Judaism. Your grandchildren are then considered blood Israel, considered a part of the Jewish people. This is the, where that concept comes from. But when we look at this, it's really interesting because there's a couple of things we see. First and foremost, it says that Edom, you're not to try and, and destroy Edom. You're not to take their property. Seir was given to Edom. That's theirs. Uh, and he says, because they are your brother. But it's interesting that we look at the names of these people, right? So Edom are the, the descendants of Esau. Okay, you follow this? So Esau, Edom, Red, Esau, uh, the, his descendants become the people group of Edom or the Edomites. Uh, but who are the Ammonites and the Moabites? We see them in numbers with the to tell of Bilam and Balak, and Bilam trying to curse Israel at the behest of Balak, but was unable to, and then ultimately loops back around, and Bilam goes, hey, look, I couldn't curse them because God wouldn't let me, but let me tell you how you can get them. Here's how you get them. You send some women in because they're really weak on that end of the thing, right? You send some women in, some prostitutes, some temple prostitutes, whatever. They will fall. I promise you, you will watch it. They will give in to their temptation. And so Balak goes, all right, let's give it a try. And they send in Ammonite and Moabite women, uh, prostitutes, uh, temple prostitutes of their, their various deities into Israel. And Israel ends up falling to the temptation and gives in to the sin. So it ends up that Bilam roundabout is still able to curse Israel. He couldn't speak the words because I don't know, I wouldn't let him, but he's able to curse Israel. So who are the Ammonites and the Moabites? We already know the Edomites are descendants of Esau, so they are very literally blood connected to Israel. But who are the Moabites and the Ammonites? If we go back to Genesis, particularly Genesis chapter 19, verse 35, Genesis 19, verse 35 says, So they made their father drink wine that night as well. And the younger got up and lay down with him, and he did not know that she lay down and got, that she lay down and got up. So Lot's two daughters became pregnant by their father. Then the firstborn gave birth to a son and named him Moab. He is the ancestors of the Moabites to this day. The younger also gave birth to a son and named him Ben-Ami. He is the ancestor of the sons of Ammon to this day. All right, so if you backtrack again a little bit farther, we're going to go back to Abraham. When Abraham's called out of Ur Chaldees, he's still Avram. His name has not been changed yet. He's still Avram. He's called out of Ur Chaldees. As he's on his journey, God says, hey, I want you to leave everyone behind, all of your father's household. You and your wife get to go. You guys go. You could bring your, your wealth, your servants with you, but your, all of your father's household stays behind. And he goes, okay, great, that sounds awesome. I'm going to get a land all to myself, but I don't have any children. So who am I going to pass it off to? There's, there's this huge inheritance, but no one to inherit it. Whom? So out of a, what I believe was a lack of full faith, he had faith, right? He got up and went when God said, get up and go, but he didn't have 100% full faith. And he takes a lot with him, just in case, just on the off chance that things don't pan out. He's got an inheritor with him. And he brings Lot, who's his nephew, along for the journey, even though God said, leave everybody behind. So right out the gate, we know that the Ammonites and the Moabites become enemies of Israel, but it's really all traces back to Abraham. Most of, it, most of Israel's early enemies trace back to Abraham, by the way. Uh, Abraham had a really, we look at Abraham like he's this, you know, this guy gets it all right, everything's good, everything's great, he's righteous, he's, he's all, but Abraham made some terrible mistakes, particularly in his lack of faith in God's promises being fulfilled by God's hand. Right? He kept wanting to make it happen. Anybody feel like that before? Anybody ever felt like God gave you a word and you're like, okay, how can I make this happen? And God goes, not again. Look, just sit down and shut up. Let me do my thing and you just trust me. Right? Well, Abraham didn't let him do his thing. He kept trying to do it for him. So he brings Lot along and then that creates some animosity between Lot's shepherds and, and, and family and Abraham's shepherds. So then they part ways and Lot ends up going towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah gets destroyed. Lot and his daughters run away. His wife gets uh, turned to a pillar of salt because she looked back at the mess that was going on. And Lot and his daughters run off, and they think, I mean, this is like some apocryphal kind of action here, right? Uh, fire and brimstone from the heavens destroys everything. They think they're the last humans alive, or at least his daughters do. And they're like, okay, well, I guess it's our job to carry on what Adam and Eve started. Let's pop a few kids out. And they end up having ancestral relations with their father, and we get the Ammonites and Moabites. So long story short, if Abraham had simply listened to God and left everybody behind, we would not have this particular passage of Deuteronomy today uh, or Bilam and Balak and everything that went along with that. But alas, here we are. And what's interesting is God says, 
not that they are not to be a part of Israel for ten, uh, at least 10 generations only because Bilam tried to curse Israel, but specifically, he says, they did not approach you when you left Egypt with food and water. And another way we can look at this is they didn't approach you with shalom, with peace, right? Instead, they come at us with war. They wanted to come and fight Israel. They wanted to wipe Israel out, but they didn't think they were strong enough to do it, so they wanted to find a roundabout way to do it. And so it's interesting that in this week's Parsha, that the, this passage here dealing with uh, the Ammonites and the Moabites, that the Lord says, you're not to allow them to become a part of Israel because they were not giving, they didn't meet you with food and water or with shalom, with peace. And the way that I would describe that is, especially in light of the way that we see things play out later throughout the scriptures and particularly in the Brich Hadashah, is they were not, uh, as we would call it today, they were not approaching Israel as the hands and feet of Messiah. Here you have a nation leaving slavery. They come across the, the Yam Suf, the Sea of Reeds. They come out. Everybody's aware. By the time that the second generation finally goes to the promised land, when Joshua sends two spies in, Rahab says, look, we've been quaking our boots or in our sandals probably for 40 years. What took you so long? Everybody's already afraid of you. You could have done this 40 years ago. And I imagine they come back with that mess and Joshua's like, I told them, but they wouldn't listen to me. Right? Anybody feel like that sometimes? And so as all of this is playing out, uh, we have the Moabites, the Ammonites that are a problem for Israel. They, they approach Israel without peace or without food and water. They aren't taking care of God's people who are realistically relatives of theirs. They're cousins, right? They're not taking care of their own family who have walked out of slavery, who uh, aside from what they were able to acquire as they were leaving Egypt, they're leaving with nothing. They've got nothing. They're not wealthy people. They do have animals and such, but they're, you know, they, they could use a little assistance, a little help, a little love. And then we have the Edomites, uh, which are descendants of Esau, uh, and the Egyptians, right? The Edomites, when Israel left Egypt in Numbers, we read that they specifically went towards the Edomites, and they said to the Edomites, hey, could we maybe come through, like, we're not trying to uh, take anything of yours. We don't want your land. God already told us we can't do it. May could we maybe cut through as a shortcut, and anything we might eat or drink, we'll pay for. Like, we don't want free load. We're going to give you for it. Just let us come through. And the Edomites come out and say, you come anywhere near us, and we're going to attack and kill you. So pay attention to this, that the Edomites, who are descendants of Esau, who have a special blessing upon them already, and technically should have been a part of Israel, who are, are uh, descendants of Esau, they have a special blessing, they have a special land dedicated to them in Seir. The Edomites approach Israel with anger, with fear, with wrath, and yet they're told they could come into Israel easily. And the Egyptians enslaved us and beat us and tried to kill us. And yet they're told they can come in easily. Why? Because the Egyptians acted as the hands and feet of Messiah, if you would, in that they actually brought, they took Israel in, in the early days of their going to Egypt, they took Israel in, they cared for them, they nurtured them. The nation grew from a infantile family to a nation of hundreds of thousands of people while they were in Egypt, because the Egyptians in the early days nourished them, cared for them, gave them shalom and peace. Now, later on, things flipped around pretty bad, and things got a little ugly. But it's interesting when we look at this, that as the Edomites reject passage, food and water literally to Israel, they are shown quite a bit more favor than the Ammonites and the Moabites. But the Ammonites and Moabites, who were also family of Israel, were rejected because they did not meet Israel with bread, water, and shalom, but rather with an attack of Bilak and Bilam. When Edom approached, Edom was going to approach physically. When uh, the Ammonites and the Moabites approached Israel to attack them, they came to approach spiritually. They wanted to wreck what God was doing in Israel. The Edomites just wanted to protect themselves. They were scared to death of this massive people group that was leaving Egypt. They were afraid of what might happen. And even though Moses said, we come in peace, uh, they still were afraid of it. But the Ammonites and the Moabites, who also were afraid of Israel, they didn't try to approach with an attack. They didn't try to approach with love and mercy. Instead, they tried to destroy Israel spiritually by trying to curse Israel, ultimately by sending uh, uh, temptation into the midst of Israel to tear them down and to rip them apart. Now, I, I think it's really interesting, and I talked at the beginning about the idea of like intrusive thoughts and my, you know, sarcastically doing horrible things to hitchhikers, like telling them that they, would walk, they could walk or uh, thumbs up to them and, and so on. But the reality is, is that often in the world that we live in today, we, we often will react to the world around us in that way. I saw a video 
uh, yesterday, I think it was, um, of somebody had, had was sitting on the opposite side of the road. There was a, a homeless person in New York laying on the ground, sleeping on the sidewalk. And there were people that the, the person in the video just assumed they were New Yorkers that just walked right by like nothing was happening, which, by the way, happens all the time because there's a lot of homeless people in New York and most metropolitan cities. There's a lot of homeless people, and people just keep on going about their life because if you stop for every single one of them, you're never going to get anything done. It's not them trying to be rude. There's a recognition that they're there, and they're, they, they have to keep going on about their life. But this person's on the other side of the road taking a video saying, oh, my God, can you believe these New Yorkers? There's somebody homeless on the road, and they just keep walking by like nobody cares. And somebody retorts to that and goes, but aren't you on the other side of the road taking a video of it for in entertainment, for content? Rather than actually doing something yourself, you're just accusing somebody else of not being the hands and feet, of not actually caring for somebody, of not actually nurturing somebody. And when we look at the Word of God, and, and particularly this passage that says that the Ammonites and Moabites did not approach Israel with food and water, or as I interpret it, with peace, um, what's really intriguing here is something that we read from Yeshua's words. And again, as we get ready to move there, I want to first reiterate our principle again, because we got to keep this in mind. This is vital to the reality of who we are as believers, especially in a world as disjointed, disconnected, and disunified as we live in, in which everybody is always at each other's throats. We, as followers of Messiah, have a distinct and unique calling to be loving, to be gracious, to be merciful, to care for those who are unable to care for themselves, and so on. And so our principle, again, we are empowered with the Ruach HaKodesh, with the Holy Spirit, to serve as the hands and feet of Messiah. So we see two things in this week's Parsha with this particular passage. First, that the Ammonites and the, uh, the Moabites did not approach Israel with food and water, uh, or ultimately shalom. And so in Matthew 25, we see this. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 39. And this passage actually goes on quite a bit longer. Uh, I'm going to summarize some of that. But 20, uh, 25, verse 31 says, Now when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, this is one of the parables. There's quite a few parables in this section of Matthew that he's dealing with. But he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Now, in a moment, he's going to clarify who the sheep and goat are, based off of him saying the sheep on the right and the goat on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him. Keep in mind, he's talking to those on the right, which he says separates the sheep and, sheep and the goat, the sheep to the right, the goats to the left. So now we see that those that are, on, are, are considered the sheep, those that are on his right are being considered in this parable as being the righteous. It says, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The next thing that we read in that passage, and I appear to have cut it off in my text, unfortunately. Uh, the next thing that we see in this passage that's really interesting is that the response is not that you physically did this for Messiah, not that they physically gave this to Messiah, took care of him, gave him food and what have you, but rather he says, when they ask, what in the world did we do uh, that, that we were able to do this for you when you were naked and what have you, what, what did we do? Answering them, verse 40 uh, says, Then the king will say to them, Amen, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brethren, you did for me. And then he goes on and talks to the people on the left, which we recognize to be the goats, if you would, in this parable. And he says, You can get away from me. I don't know you. Why? Because you didn't feed me when I was hungry. You didn't give me water when I was thirsty. You didn't care for me when I couldn't. You didn't see me when I was in prison. You didn't bring me peace and welcome me in as a stranger. And they say, well, when did we see you do all of this? It says the unrighteous say, when did we see you do all of this? And he says the same thing again. For what you do not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. And you will burn in hell for all eternity is, in essence, the parable here. Um, but what's really interesting to me is the same reality that we see in Parsha Kitetse, that the Ammonites and the Moabites are told, hey, 
You cannot be a part of Israel. You cannot convert into or be a proselyte into Israel and become a part of Israel because you did not approach Israel with food and water, with peace. And Messiah then ties that concept in and says, you are righteous because you took care of those that could not take care of themselves. Right? And it's really interesting when you look at this. He says, when we take care of those that can't take care of themselves, like, for instance, Congregation Shemayim Chaim sponsoring uh, the orphanage in Kenya, uh, KRCH, the Kombo uh, Rehema Children's Home in, in uh, Kenya. They've got 70 something kids in rural, a rural village in Kenya. They literally, for the most part, are struggling on a day to day basis. And Pastor Robert will message me. He's the pastor that oversees the orphanage. Him and his wife do. He'll message me at the beginning of the month, every month after we send uh, re- the, the funds to them for, for resources. He says, look, we were down to the bottom of the barrel when it came to our storage. We had nothing left. And you guys came through at just the right time. And that's not to pretend like we're sending like boo koodles of money. We're, we're sending you know, what for any of our budgets would likely be chump change. Uh, in, in a lot of ways. But the reality is, is that in the rural village that they're in, in Keumbu, in Kenya, it goes a long way. It's able to help in a lot of ways that we couldn't imagine, right? And so we're able to very literally be the hands of feet of Messiah for them. And I'm not saying that because we support a random uh, orphanage in Kenya that like we're selling the most righteous people in the world. I'm only using that as an example that we as individuals and we as a community in the body of Messiah, we have a unique opportunity through the Ruach HaKodesh's empowerment in our lives to be able to live out the calling to be the hands of feet of Messiah, to be able to impact the world around us by doing good for others, by doing the opposite of what Edom, or I'm sorry, the opposite of what the Ammonites and the Moabites did for Israel. You know, they're accused of not providing food and water, of not providing peace. We have the opportunity to meet the needs of those who would otherwise not be able to have their needs met. Whether it's very literally through giving food and water to people, whether it's through financially supporting somebody. Danielle and I have been in the grocery store, and I strongly encourage you, do not think that you're too busy to listen to the voice of God. Uh, a number of years ago when we were in New York, uh, the, the Lord kind of hit me with this. There was this period of time where it seemed like there was this overarching, almost uh, uh, en- uh, endemic of people that were uh, middle-aged or slightly over middle-aged men that had really good jobs that for whatever reason were laid off and tried to find other jobs, couldn't find a job. And there was, there was this whole series of articles almost on a daily basis where they felt like they had hit the end of the line. They were too old to get a, 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 a job that they could work up through. They didn't have the skills or the education to get the job. They thought they needed to meet the income requirements that their family had. And the only solution that they could find was to, and, and this is a terrible thing that happened, but was to either kill themselves or to kill their family and themselves because they were at a place where they felt like they had no hope left. And the only solution they had was to end everything. And the Lord hit me as I kept reading article after article after article, almost exactly the same story over and over and over again. And the Lord hit me and said, how do you know that you aren't the last chance for that person to see the light of Messiah and have their heart changed and to find the hope that they're looking for? And the, the real realization that I had as, as the Lord and I were kind of having this conversation was, you know, you ever been at the gas pump and you felt the Lord put it on your heart to talk to the person on the other side? Um, I don't know whether he feels this or not, but my father-in-law can't stand at a gas pump without talking to the person on the other side and almost always starts that conversation out, do you know Yeshua? I'm like, what? <laughs> right? Almost always. But you ever been sitting there pumping gas and you just felt like the Lord put on your heart to talk to the person on the other side? And you went, I'm too busy. I got to get to work. I've got a meeting. I've got this. I've got that. I've got... And, and it was in those situations that the Lord, I felt on my heart say, how do you know that I didn't put you there at that unique moment with the distinct opportunity to shine the hope and the light of Messiah in this person's life so that they don't become the next article, right? And so Danielle and I live our life in, in a certain way, and that's that when we hear the Lord, uh, we feel the Lord put a word on our heart, we feel the Lord leading us to do something, we just do it. Sometimes we kind of argue about it a little bit, but we just do it because usually he's right and, I, and I'm wrong. And, and when I find myself right, it's really because I'm wrong and I wasn't listening to him to begin with. Um, but nonetheless, he's right and I'm wrong is usually how it plays out. Uh, and so we've been in the grocery store and pushing our cart to the, the register and saw young couples standing in the, the aisle debating verbally, vocally. I mean, not trying to be real out about it, but debating, do we have the money to get the diapers? 
Or do we have the money to get the formula with a baby in the, the car seat, the, the, the car carrier uh, on the, the, the cart and felt the Lord say, go get them a bag of diapers. Just be a blessing. Don't say anything. Just go get a bag of diapers. We go get a bag of diapers, pay for them, walk over and say, hey, we didn't mean to eavesdrop, but we really felt the Lord put on our heart to do this. We just want to give you some diapers so you don't have to make this decision. Here's some diapers. Uh, just know that it comes from, from the love of the Lord. It comes from our heart. And just watching people in such a circumstance, uh, almost break down because they were very literally struggling. Do we get this or this? The baby needs both. Which do we get? And they didn't have the resources to do both. And we didn't showboat it. We didn't make a big thing about it. We didn't, you know, oh, make sure you pass it along to the next person or anything like that. We just wanted to be a blessing because the Lord put it on our heart to be a blessing. And then the conversations that then come after right? And the same thing if you're, you know, wherever it is, a grocery store, a restaurant, uh, the, the gas station, whatever it is, if the Lord puts it on your heart to be the hands and feet of Messiah, we have an obligation to, uh, to do so. We are empowered in the Ruach HaKodesh, our principle. We are empowered in the Ruach HaKodesh to serve as the hands and feet of Messiah. And he gives us these opportunities time and time again to do so. The second reality uh, of this Parsha, as we get closer to, uh, to, to the end of this message, the second reality of this Parsha, and, and particularly this section here about the Ammonites and the Moabites, is that the Ammonites and the Moabites, likewise the Edomites and the Egyptians, hated Israel. They were afraid of them. They were terrified of what they might do to them because of their sheer size and numbers. Keep in mind, Israel left Egypt with, Israel's, with Egypt's weapons, ready for war, but had no clue that they were capable of war. And God led them in a roundabout way after they came out of Egypt so that they wouldn't come to war right out the gate because they would freak out and go back to Egypt. Uh, and he brings them to a dead end and Egypt comes crashing down. And instead of them going, hey, we've got Egypt's weapons. What in the world could they do to us? They turn around and went, Moses, how could you bring us out here to die? Were there not enough graves back there? And the reality is, is that the, the enemies of Egypt hated and feared them not because there was anything specific to the size, the magnitude, the war prowess of Israel, but because, as we read in this week's Parsha, of the one who dwells in their midst. They were terrified of Israel because the presence of the God of all creation dwelled in their midst. And then we read Yeshua's words in John 15, beginning with verse 18, in which Yeshua kind of brings this home for us and, and reiterates to us a very similar to reality to what Israel experienced in the wilderness. It says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But you are not of the world, since I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will per persecute you also. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you for the sake of my name, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had, come, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me also hates my father. So he says, the world's going to hate you, but it's not really you that they hate, it's me in you that they hate. And then they say, but he, they also hate me, but it's not really me that they hate, it is my father that they hate. If I had not done works among them that no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and have hated both me and my father. So I fulfilled the word written in their scripture. They hated me for no reason. When the helper comes, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, is the helper he's speaking of. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also testify because you have been with me from the beginning. It says, the world will hate you. Hate to break it to you. Being a, a follower of Messiah doesn't mean everything's going to be hunky-dory. It doesn't mean everything's going to be easy and great. The world is not going to like you. But it's not you that they dislike. It's not you that the world hates. It is the one who dwells in your midst that they are terrified of. Not because they're terrified of the destruction and the havoc that he could reach, wreak, but because they're terrified of the fact that, and all of us pre-Messiah were very much in this state, we were terrified of the fact that we are sinful and fallen. We may not recognize it, but we do recognize when the presence of God is in our midst that we are not worthy of his presence. 
And so it wasn't that uh, the, the Moabites and the Ammonites were terrified of Israel as much as they were terrified of the presence of God of which they could see and sense in Israel's midst. And so again, our principle today, we are empowered with the Ruach HaKodesh to serve as the hands and feet of Messiah and the world around us very much as was the case in Yeshua's day in the Gospels, if uh, Brooke will make her way back up. The world around us today very much is still terrified of the reality of the presence of God in their midst because it's something that isn't yet understood short of actually experiencing the redemption, the power of the blood of Messiah and the presence, the indwelling of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit in our lives. And even when the world is uh, uh, fearful of us, when they hate us, when they attack us, when they come at us because of our faith, we are still called to be the hands and feet of Messiah. We're still called to be loving, to be gracious, to be merciful, a.k.a. in uh, Galatians when we read that whole passage about the fruit of the Spirit, yeah, all of that stuff. Like when the Spirit is truly active in our lives, that stuff's going to permeate us. Even if the world is throwing uh, you know, spitballs at us, even if the world is cussing out, us out, even if the world is trying to trip us while we walk down the hallway, even if the world is being mean to us, the reality is that the Spirit of God is active and alive in our midst so that we can live a life in which the world around us will see the truth of Messiah, so that we can approach those who uh, we don't quite understand, who we don't quite know, who we don't quite uh, uh, know what God wants to do with, but we can approach them with food and water and with shalom so that they can come to know the truth of Messiah. For some of us, maybe this is very literally taking care of the sick, the widow, the orphan, the needy. I've gone uh, on trips with JVMI, Jewish Voice Ministries International, to Zimbabwe and to Ethiopia and served in medical clinics and watched as people's lives were changed by simple dental care, by simple uh, minor surgical procedures, by simple treatments for things like cold and flu and so on. Their lives were changed. These are things that we take for granted here. Their lives were changed. They live in... The, now, these medical clinics are set up in extremely rural areas, but they live in areas where they don't have access to most of the things that we take for granted. Many of whom, they, many of them don't have cars. They don't have ways to get around real easy. They wait for rural buses to come in to drive them hours away to get into cities to go uh, see doctors or whatever else. And a lot of times they forego it all because it's just not worth the headache. But when we're there physically serving as the hands and feet of Messiah, it changes lives. And so I want to encourage you today to not be like the Moabites and the Ammonites who refuse to approach with the peace of God, who refuse to approach with food and water, but instead to be the hands and feet of Messiah, led by the Ruach HaKodesh, led by the Holy Spirit, to walk in the world around us, ready to meet the needs of those around us, whether it's physical needs, or spiritual needs, emotional needs, whatever it is, be ready and be prepared that when the Lord says, hey, you go and do, that you're able and willing to go and do. Because it's in those opportunities that we're able to watch the hand of God move through our lives to impact the world around us in a way that they will not only see Messiah in us, but yearn to experience Messiah in their hearts and their lives. Amen. Avrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word, which is ever living, ever breathing, and ever active in our midst. Father, I pray that you will continue to bolster and to stoke the fire of your Ruach HaKodesh in our hearts and our lives. Continue to uh, pour out your revival upon us that we may see your might and power move in mighty and powerful ways that we may willingly and gladly serve those around us for your kingdom above all else. Not worried about what others may think, not worried about uh, what meetings we have next, not worried about how busy our schedule is, but willing and able to drop everything to serve you as you lead and guide us to serve those around us. Lord, we thank you that you have called us to physically be the hands of feet of Messiah in a world that has rejected you. In a world that is terrified of your presence in their midst, you have given us your presence in our hearts and our lives so that we can stand firm as a beacon, as a lighthouse in a dark world so that others may come to find and know you. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray and everyone says, Amen.